And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Currently, de currently developing Voyager Tactics, which is at its point five release as of a few days ago. The one and only Saito Kun. How you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Well, tonight on my end, and morning on your end, because time zones. Yep. I'm pretty sure if I moved across the if I moved across the ocean, I'd still end up having time zone issues. It's just I'd. I'd move to I'd move to some place in East Asia and then have a bunch of Americans as guests. Yeah, that would be worse for you, definitely. I'd I'd say it's a case of not of um replacing one problem with another problem. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you wouldn't want to be a team lead or anyone who coordinates a lot of people. And not be on the same time zone. That's sort of something I had to deal with. Yeah, I can I can certainly understand that. So obviously it's been it's been a it's been a significant bit. There were a lot of there were a lot of work in progress pages er, early on, and they're still they're still kind of are. But the mm. the big one the big addition is having a having a character sheet proper um yeah i'm curious i'm curious because one of the big things i noticed was was it being a one page were you drawing upon some of your experiences with pbta like stuff to get to try and get it all in one page like that uh yeah so i guess it was partly my experiences with let's say uh Blades in the Dark style play sheets mm. um, when you know, working on the previous game, uh, our spell is Steel. But uh, but not just that, but I also just generally like the idea of having it all fit into one sheet, mostly because of like the prior, um, the current um, hallmarks of uh, the design philosophies I have for Voyager Tactics, which is to try and minimize as much uh, bookkeeping as possible uh, during like a live game. So, uh, so the character sheet I wanted it to be uh, one of the main examples of that to sort of keep all the abilities and inventory stuff in a single space, and that sort of informed the gameplay as well, uh, which is why. You only really have like two main pieces of equipment, and all the other items are sort of in a short list. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the, I had already we'd already talked a bit about the visual design, so I won't I won't go too far into that and re and repeat what um we had talked about, but when it Oh, one of the big things, of course, is the um, way the way you have di the way you have die sized based on the a based on an action point approach. Mm. And one of the things I was curious about is: do you still have do you still have that die size attitude when it comes to roles that are outside of combat? Uh, yeah. So you would still technically. Uh, so I made I made the action system to sort of be compatible with combat and anything outside of it as well because you know uh, that's why it's called an action role and not necessarily like a combat role or an attack role mm -hmm. because all of the actions uh, were intended to be uh, usable in and out combat and that applies to the action duration as well so during let's say a situation where you're trying to sneak into uh, a base of some sort uh 
you could take your time doing so as a slow action and that would allow you to roll a higher size die a d12 and uh get a hopefully better uh outcome for that roll but uh from there the gm would sort of determine whether or not the thing you're doing is time sensitive so if the gm says that the guard might be about to turn around really soon and you only have like the span of a medium or fast action to do so, then that will sort of create that sort of pressure for the player. Given that, have, have, have you considered the idea of using the AP system as kind of a um, time budget for certain circumstances? You mean like a kind of clocks type of approach? Yeah. You're still sp you're still spending AP, but instead of the rule of three, it is it is a case of um, sp of you're spending t you're spending time. Like let's say let's go let's go with the good old you've got to pick a lock up while um while it while in a stealth mission. You know that's a good that's a good chestnut to go with. And mm. let's say the let's say for this case the action the um. The t the time AP is um five. You're you're going you're going with a slow you're going with a um one AP two AP or three AP action. But the risk is if you botch that that's taken away from it. So it's not exactly the same as a clock. It's still it's using a similar concept just within the risk reward setup of that AP system. Yeah, uh, that's good actually. I should use that, like the sense of a, like a countdown thing. Yeah, where, uh, you can sort of take any combination of actions within that, uh, limit. I guess. Hmm. Yeah, because right now, right now the system you're using is additive, uh, rather than with subtractive, which is the momentum system. But I think. For certain task, this sort of subtractive system might work better actually, because the current momentum system is you have to gain a certain number of successes to count it up. Mm -hmm. I th I think th I think can do you can do you can do both obviously. There's I've noticed that there's plenty of. Oh, mechanics that you have that are optional for reinforcing a certain theme. This would just be another example of that. Yeah. Now, that uh, now one of the one of the big things that I did that I did notice was um in regard was in regards to utilizing. Utilizing utilizing the faction system because I think that I think that was there to a point, but not at but not as prevalent as it is in this version. Mm -hmm. So, I think one of the things I was curious about is um, how how the faction system kind of came to came to be with how you intended to use it. Was it something that you had decided on earlier? Was it something you? had thought about doing later on in the development? Well, the factions were largely mainly just a world-building choice because uh, Voyager did start out initially not really as a game, but just as like the sort of fantasy sandbox that I used to sort of put in all the cool ideas I wanted. And that's sort of where the factions came about. But as it stands now, uh, there's not, uh, it's still incomplete in regards to all the faction mechanics that could happen in there, things like reputation and all that. But uh, I have sort of laid a bit of the groundwork there regarding Voyager ranks, which is essentially like your level. Mm. Uh, but this level is less an indication of your innate power and more of just your social standing within the world mm -hmm. and having a high enough rank 
would allow you uh, easier access to certain factions. Uh, and of course, uh, on each faction's description within the book, there's like a lot of notes regarding uh, how to world build for it with your group um, and their general disposition, how they would reward you, uh, notes like that. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mis if I'm not mistaken, with each of the um, action types, there you have a way that they can be used in um, in combat in so in some form. Or yes. at, le at least a active and reactive way to way to use each move. I guess is the better way for me to put it. Uh, some are reactive, yes, like parrying and dodging. Uh, others are more active, uh, like trying to take control of something or trying to recall a piece of information. It did give. It did make me chuckle a little bit that um, you have the, you have parry associated with both hit and aim. You know, so somebody can do the the old William Tell and shoot down projectiles. Yes, exactly. As well as the possibility of sh of um, shooting in melee. Yeah, we didn't want to like limit uh, players in regards to like you know the kind of classic disadvantage when using range in melee kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And when it now when it came to the. When it came to the concept of of revolve, not revolve, resolve and break, um, what was the goal that you had in mind for that system as as far as doing health? Uh, what what do you mean by that? Because it's, um, what were what were you trying to what were you trying to emulate? What were you trying to foster in terms of the the way you have that relationship between resolve and break to represent character health? Right, so definitely when we started out, I was using like a more traditional HP system. Mm -hmm. um, as to how Break came about, uh, I'm not sure if I remember off the top of my head, but it was sort of around the kind of idea that uh, like I wanted mechanics that would be able to, I guess, denote certain uh certain thresholds that you get uh when you either damage someone enough or you successfully inflict a type of status effect on them and partly that and also because i think the main reason was because i needed a way to sort of handle the rest and recovery system mm -hmm. because uh while i did want it to be sort of loose with it like you know it's not heavily focused on attrition where you lose more resources as you go on but i didn't want it either where healing abilities were essentially kind of just you can spam them willy-nilly and you can just sort of recover to full health after each fight um so in order to sort of balance that uh that's where the kind of break uh, bars come in, which sort of limits how much you can actually heal until uh, you chose to rest. Because uh, you by you know implementing the break system, that sort of solved two problems at once for me, which was the problem of balancing uh, healing abilities and balancing, or rather, having a need, a proper in-game need for resting and sleeping. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we talked we talked about the spheres pre um, previously and their um, loose association with um, the mat with the types of mana that are in uh, Magic: The Gathering. But there's also the fact that you can you kind of have these sphere combinations tied to archetypes with certain factions. So is that? Was that a case of ju of just expanding upon how the spheres were already already going to use, or did you already have an archetype um, system in mind 
that that one just led to the other. Uh, by archetype, did you mean the the ventures or the? Yeah, I I use I use archetype for the for those sort of classifications just out of habit. Uh, right. So previously, in the previous version, they were a bit more faction specific. Uh, in fact, in a previous layout, they were arranged in order of faction. Um, but then afterwards, uh, afterwards, I sort of noticed that uh, uh, noticed a need that players would have for you know trying to make uh, make a character of a certain class that may be from a different culture or different faction. And to accommodate that, I had to trim some of that uh, kind of faction-specific flavor and make those ventures a bit more uh, general in nature so that they could be applicable to any faction. And this is a sort of, you know, to give that little bit of extra uh, player freedom since there's just like this quite a lot of number of factions that uh, I think we will want them to sort of, you know, engage with all of them. Mm -hmm. And when it when it comes to um, when it comes to combat, uh, I do find it interesting that you want that um you specifically wanted to use a gr a grid affair with ha with how you have the area of effects with a lot of stuff which is uh, yeah. def definitely an interesting move given the background with blades in the dark since obviously blades in the dark is never going to use grid combat <laughs> yeah <laughs> though if if i recall you if i recall you admit you had mentioned that some of that was dr was drawing upon i believe arc knights uh yeah, so Blades was very useful in my research, mainly in sort of opening my mind as to how like streamlined a lot of uh game concepts I could make because uh as someone who uh started out with you know within the uh fifth edition mindset mm -hmm. uh reading Blades helped sort of like untangle a lot of the kind of things that I thought were necessary in a game and sort of help me further refine what uh what uh how unique the system I could actually make is. But I s in the end, uh in terms of like its core identity, I still wanted something that was grid based and Arc Knights was one of those influences, but also games like Fire Emblem and other sorts of tactical um, tactical uh, RPGs that sort of involve you managing different units at once. Hmm. Which definitely makes sense. Hmm. Oh. Now, one of the things that I... That has definitely been exp definitely been expanded compared to the last time I had you on was the concept of visages which is where is where we get into some of the mythology of the world of, Vo of Voyager um, yep and I'm get I'm guessing you're ha I'm guessing if I'm guessing it correctly is it a case where a vi a visage is more is more in the sense of a cosmic alignment, you know, which of what um, individual in the pantheon um, likes you. Uh, yeah. So I was waiting for this question, but uh, yes, visages are kind of uh, a new, newly uh, implemented feature, which essentially, um, for all intents and purposes, they are like the gods of this unit of this setting uh, in the sense that you can get blessings from them and they are these super powerful beings. But uh, flavor-wise, 
um, they're not like gods per se, and more like uh, embodiments of certain mythological concepts. Uh, and this is uh, as um, I speak as a mythology nerd, and one of uh, the concepts I was found interesting within uh, that sphere is the concept of comparative mythology. I believe was called where they are like the con this idea the idea that a lot of the legends of our world sort of have a common thread running through them uh, one one example is how like a lot of different cultures around the globe have the idea of like uh, of a dragon or a dragon like creature mm -hmm. or how many cultures have a flood myth of some sort so it was this sort of uh, comparative mythology idea that sort of informed the design of the visages where uh, some of them are very clearly uh, they very clearly evoke certain uh, certain uh, deities like for example one of them is kind of like uh, kind of like Zeus mm -hmm. And that is like the God King, which is the sort of the archetypal uh, pantheon leader sky god uh, archetype, which is sort of like Zeus, but also encompasses figures like like Odin, like the biblical uh, Old Testament god, and and it's sort of like an amalgamation of those concepts because in Voyager's world. Um, where it is, you know, a thousand years after, after Earth as we knew it, um, the people here wouldn't exactly know about these figures that uh, that we know so well, and they would have been, um, over time, they would have been understood as, like, like, um, like the figures in uh, this new world. Looking back at our own mythologies and they are sort of like noticing a thread between them and these sort of uh these sort of different deities sort of coalesce together as a single concept. Yeah. And in speaking of in game, uh in terms of just like their in game presence, uh they are very much influenced from uh the gods in Hades, which is one of my favorite games and it's the very uh, influential game for Voyager, which is the uh, like all the sort of kind of roguelike elements, uh, which we can touch on later. But mm -hmm. the idea that uh, you can get uh, certain blessings from like these gods that have very clear uh, identities to them, and uh, what I wanted to do is designing the the visages as well and their blessings is that a lot of them double as curses or the fact that some of these phenomena that you summon are just so like widely like wildly powerful that uh they sort of they can potentially screw anyone regardless of who's on the map simply because these you are sort of like trying to call upon a force of nature or like you know a power of something beyond the physical realm so it, it doesn't really uh it only kind of incidentally works how you want it to most of the time mm -hmm. uh, what i see it and this is just my own interpretation it is demonstrating what alignments were supposed to be uh, in the early in the early days of D. &D. Because the idea of alignments as a as a morality system was not, in my opinion, not something that it was meant to do. It's a round peg in a square hole. It was more. It was more about what what parts of the more, the more metaphysical end of things happen to favor you, and drawing upon the whole law and chaos thing from uh, Moorcock's work. Yeah, it's like just... it was, it was an actual in-universe conflict, right? They had like a pledge allegiance to. 
sometimes not even pledge allegiance, just what you're doing happens to align more with their views. Um, that's the reason I bring up the whole Eter the whole um, Eternal Champion meta series from Michael Moorcock, which gave us the Elric trilogy. Mm -hmm. In that particular thing, there's a pantheon of law and a pantheon of chaos. Um, both of them represent the w represent extremes. Uh, and honestly, it, when it when it comes to games that try and that try to carry that onward, I honestly think the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games have a better understanding of it. Hmm. Because you have you have the you have the three major um three major themes of law, chaos, and neutrality. Law and yeah. chaos. Th th and I'm and when I say the mainline, I'm of course excluding things like the Persona games. That's a whole other can of worms. I don't feel like going into. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But like law is represented by the messianic cult, and chaos usually by the Gaia cult. Mm. The context changed, but the names don't. And the idea is the um the the messianic cult tends to be the worst aspects of order, specifically mm. being very authoritarian. Ex extremely so. Whereas, if, you know, they po they posit the the law faction, the messianic cult, will often po posit that that they are bringing order to a disordered world because you know most Mega Ten games are going to be post-apocalypse. Yeah. But that but it's they can very easily slide into authoritarianism. And then you have the chaos end of things that promises fr that promises freedom and resisting tyranny but uh, but very easily spirals into full on anarchism or a or a um, might makes right um, attitude which isn't far removed from the law from the um, lawful and chaotic approaches from the from the old um, Elric books and from early D&D &D. Mm -hmm. Which is why, which is why I say, say that th that um, Mega Ten got the right idea. <laughs> Obviously, there isn't a law and chaos thing with the visit with the um, with the visages, but there is that there is that emphasis on th on um, theme when it comes to the concepts like the ruling gods, which are the big are the big concepts the demigods that are more like um local heroes and local legends the lim the liminals which are new which are um more neutral and the anti-gods who are the villains yeah so you you kind of do have that that concept of law of law chaos and neutrality there yeah there definitely is and i think I think to add as well is, uh, I did make it a point to present, uh, present all of the visages as kind of. Uh, they did represent these major concepts, but none of them necessarily had any description of their morality, because, uh, because uh, a lot of them. They act, they operate in a way that is very, um, how to say, I guess sort of like contrary to human, to regular human morality in that a lot of their actions and uh, how they approach, how the player sort of interacts with them is sort of so um, immensely powerful or uh, that impactful that it really anyone can sort of use it and and even like the empress for example which is sort of based on the ideas of like the kind of queen of heaven type goddess which is like the Hera or the goddess of love like Aphrodite that even uh, within like Greek mythology interestingly Aphrodite was not only associated with love, but also with uh, war 
and that some I think some sources say that she might have predated Ares in that regard. But yeah, she had like uh she had even had like epithets like Aphrodite Araya, which is of like alluding to her nature as both a goddess of war and love. And that sort of and this kind of um manifold nature was sort of what I wanted to uh push home with the visitors how um how like the god king can represent mm. law and order but also um the hoarding of knowledge such as when Odin gave up one of his eyes to gain knowledge and how they are more in you know more similar to the traditional uh Greek or Norse gods in that regard where they have these very um differing motivations and natures that they don't uh yeah yeah um and when it co- when it comes to the vis- when it comes to the um visages and those different interpretations I'm somewhat reminded of the five aspect thing that you have with um Moon Knight's relationship with Konshu who I mean yeah yeah on the surface Konshu is meant to be this god this god of the moon but that with Warren Ellis's run of the of the character in the comic, he put forth the idea that Mark Spector isn't insane. He's just trying to rationalize the five aspects that Konshu embodies as his fist: um, the Pathfinder, the um, Defender, the Embracer, the Watcher of, over- of Overnight Travelers, and the one who lives on Hearts. Mm. Oh. and his way and his way of trying to rationalize the those fi- the being those five aspects is through Spectre's multiple personalities. Oh. Mm. I'm not too familiar with it, but yeah, yeah I can sort of get the gist. Mm-hmm. And the of. Now one of the other um one of the other now of course of course there is the um whole thing with the sapiens which we are we already co- we already covered the only real change there is that there's more more of them and more um more tra- more traits um I'm get oh, I'm yeah. guessing I'm guessing for each um sapient you plan on having En- enough traits that you could reasonably do a um, random die roll with, with it for character creation if someone wanted to. Uh, yeah, you certainly could. There's quite a lot of uh, rollable lists throughout the book, actually. And well, there's there's quite a few there's quite a few um, sa- there's quite a few sapients, obviously. And yeah. I will, and when it comes when it comes to the um, the whole co- the whole concept of the light and shadow aspect with the um, sphere combination that you have, um, I'm curious how I'm curious how those aspects might manifest themselves in ga- in um, gameplay. Uh, you mean the spheres? Yeah, specifically the the light aspect and the shadow aspect. So, uh, the spheres, uh, because Voyager doesn't necessarily have kind of the traditional uh, attributes, like you know the common six or five spread of like your strength and dexterity, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the actions, the ten actions they use, they are more close uh, mechanically to like skills. Uh, so in regards to like actual, uh, like what you would actually use to sort of inform your character's decisions, uh, I came up with the sphere system, which is essentially kind of like five elements that sort of inform like how you take an action so uh what you would do is 
like you can have the same action which is like let's say um moving forward uh to block uh block a strike but depending on your character based on your sphere your sphere is supposed to help you is is a largely a sort of like a thing to help you role play your character better mm-hmm. in the sense that uh if you are aligned more to the sun sphere which is more fiery and impulsive that sort of paints your action as one that's more impulsive and rushing into battle whereas if you align more with the moon sphere which is associated with like water and foresight and knowledge uh you would probably possibly look at it more as analyzing the situation and then acting accordingly so it's largely for role play but it does grant you a mechanical benefit in that um in like certain cases where because uh, the game uses a lot of opposed roles contested roles that in the case of a tie or certain situations where an enemy would normally have an advantage in that role uh playing into your sphere which is you know role playing into your character's nature because they are kind of uh aligning their actions to their to their uh default nature mm-hmm. they're sort of more in tune with it and therefore uh you would sort of automatically succeed in uh these sort of opposed opposed roles yeah now when it comes Shifting the factions for a bit, when it comes to the equipment list that each one has, um, is it a, is it a case where you're you're um getting the, you're getting those bits of equipment in order of the order of the number as you progress, or is there a different approach? So, uh, the way it's laid out in the book right now, we have all the equipment arranged by faction. So each faction has its own uh, list of equipment that's associated with that faction. So uh, one faction is sort of kind of like the 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 sort of eastern uh, eastern faction. So it has kind of equipment that are associated with like katanas and uh, kusarigamas, that, those kind of weapons. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and excuse me if you hear like background noise. This is a passing truck, but no, no worries. Yeah, but uh, they're right now arranged by faction because I think it's helpful for the player to sort of uh because we kind of you know lack uh, uh lack artwork to sort of help evoke some of these factions so far mm-hmm. that uh, I'm kind of using their list of equipments and various concepts to sort of help give the player an idea of what um what kind of play styles or what kind of items are associated with those factions and they're all rollable lists meaning you can randomize if you want to or pick one that you would like these are all available at character creation because these are pretty much common items uh i will add that uh just from like uh feedback from people who've read the rule book so far that uh we'll probably i'll probably rearrange the layout again so that uh all these character creation options are probably like in a more consolidated list mm-hmm. uh as opposed to sort of scattered around the different factions right now so that uh, players can more easily access them, mm-hmm. and but if it is associated with a faction, there will probably be like maybe a note there on on the item description itself. Yeah. Because uh, with with some of the uh, with some of the equipment, uh, I can, I obviously couldn't help but notice a bunch of um, tags, like what like whether something's um, light, regular, or he- or heavy, as well as um, tags like melee, tags like hit, tags like save. Um, I'm get I'm guessing well I'm guessing well j- or rather wield. J- 
just determines whether it's going to be a light, medium, or, he or heavy weapon regarding the um, load that you can carry. Yeah. Um, with the line under that, I'm guessing that's determined whether it's that's to determine whether it's a me a melee weapon, a ranged weapon, a um, hi a hybrid weapon, and how and how it's used. Yeah. So, uh, definitely my uh design approach when going with items was definitely. I wanted to prevent the kind of stat uh, bloat that was that I've observed uh, in other RPGs where you had to track, for example, their weight, goal value, specific uh, specific damage dice, and all these sort of things. Uh, and so I tried to streamline the items as much as possible to its most relevant information. So what we have is is associated. Uh, weight, uh, which you said it was light, uh, regular, and heavy. And that sort of determines uh, what kind of actions you can use it for. So a light weapon would be able to make uh, fast and medium attacks, but not slow attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that's, and this is just like strictly mechanically, if you know the player wanted to explain that they wanted to use a slow action to maybe cut a rope or do something more specific, then they would have uh, the freedom to do so. But in terms of just strictly, you know, like a straight attack, then normally you wouldn't. And they have the worn or wielded property, which is basically something that you held in your hand mm -hmm. uh, versus something that you have on your body. So that, uh, so armor versus things like uh, weapons and shields are included in the wield category, which is why it was called wield and not weapon specifically, because uh, shields kind of are in that weird middle ground. Mm -hmm. And they also have an associated action, which is just basically, you know, among the 10 actions, what would you use them for? And so for melee weapons, you would use hit, and for range weapons, you would use aim, and then shields. Uh, you will use hit, but also save to block. And then, other than that, it was just um, the uh, whether it was ranged or melee, as which you know is denoted by the action. And this is basically allows me to sort of have um, a list of items that uh, that first and foremost I wanted them to be uh, easily readable at a glance and evocative mm -hmm. meaning uh a having a certain weapon sort of informs uh informs your play style and the flavor of your character yeah uh, when it when it comes to wep when it comes to weapons that would use say aim um f going forward would ones that it, would with ones that are listed as aim would you have it listed out what their range is or are you going with a universal um range band yeah so uh so range so yeah in terms of like let's say fifth edition type weapons range weapons they all have a certain range increment which mm -hmm. is like like normally like 60 to 200 feet or anything like that um and for me that was the type of granularity I wanted to avoid with Voyager, mainly because, uh, number one, for lack of bookkeeping, as I mentioned, but also in general, uh, because of its more uh, kind of anime influence, uh, the anime influences I wanted to make, and also just in terms of like uh, action focused fiction where you know you sort of not really focused on uh the specific ranges and more towards you know what is kind of near or far but i also it is sort of a fun exercise because i wanted uh something that was kind of abstract enough where you didn't have to calculate exactly mm. in terms of numbers 
but also something that had enough of a crunch to it because I was operating on like a grid because uh, I knew that I didn't want to use like abstract ranges or zones for this game. So that led to a kind of universal uh, range calculation, which is just based on the action duration you were using. So if you are using like a fast action, which was a D4, then your range would just be within four tiles uh, in a straight line. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it was a, a medium action, which is a D8, it'd be a eight tiles, and a slow action, D12, would be 12 tiles. And this effective distance is sort of an abstraction of your accuracy. Uh, so the player is sort of not meant to see it as... Uh, because they it'd be it'd be kind of weird to imagine it as you know why would the same gun be have a range of four tiles but then suddenly it's able to shoot at twelve tiles but it's more like uh it more it's more of like explaining your accuracy because as a fast action you're sort of imagining like a quick draw you just sort of like immediately pulling it and firing so uh it'll be very like off the cuff it'd be like a hip fire shot so it would be it can still be effective up close but it would definitely not be accurate long ranges whereas a slow action you can imagine like a sniper uh, sort of holding up on a hill somewhere and really training their shot and that's why their effective distance is increased Mm -hmm. so for the same weapon uh and really this is sort of like my approach with like items and weapons is that the same kind of action or weapon that you use because of uh, the action duration, whether it is fast, medium, or slow in nature, uh, that flavors, uh, it not only flavors how you use that item in terms of how you would describe it, but also has like an actual tangible mechanical, uh, uh, mecha- mechanical, input into the game mm-hmm. yeah and with with that in with that in mind um, when it comes to ventures which I guess is the closest thing there is to classes in this um, system yeah. um, is it a case where where um each uh, where each faction is going to have its own pool of um of of ventures within the three special within um the three specializations uh yeah so the three so you have like the main ventures which is essentially like your job mm-hmm. um and each uh each venture has specializations which for all intents and purposes they're like subclasses uh that you can sort of spec into and uh what they're meant to be is each specialization is sort of meant to be a more narrow play style that you wanted to go into so Mm -hmm. one of them uh, so there's like the operative venture, which is just like a general type of sci-fi trooper type uh, job uh, with very basic abilities. But it has two different specializations, which is the jet core, the jet core training, uh, which is more focused on using uh, a jetpack to move around mm. and aerial combat. And another is the field doctor, which is a healing. Uh, specialization so uh, so from there you can see that some of these specializations are kind of uh, kind of general in that it's revolved around, around healing or defending allies where some can be as specific as uh, revolving around having a play style revolve around a certain item because the jetpack is like one of the items you can take during character creation and that specialization just hones in on that. Uh, and it also 
why they are designed this way also has to do with what I said earlier about wanting to make uh, the, the main ventures more general so that they can kind of be applicable to different uh, factions as needed. But as you get into the specializations, the subclasses, they get more uh, specific and the and these specializations are actually kind of what determines your role in combat. So uh, let's say using fifth edition as an example, you have like you have like let's say the barbarian, which is by its nature, uh, by its core nature, is more of like a tanky class, whereas something like a mage. Uh, a wizard would be more of like a ranged focus and it's very squishy. But uh but with this I wanted to make each venture a bit more general and the specialization is sort of the more specific play style you wanted to go into, whether uh you wanted to uh, be more of a healer or more of a mobile fighter, uh that sort of determined the more you narrow down your specializations and it's also meant to be kind of more modular in nature as well because uh, this is sort of partly informed by kind of what I learned about like class feats in Pathfinder for example mm -hmm. and where you would sort of take and learn abilities from these specializations to sort of uh, more focus your play style and take different, uh, take what suits your needs as a player mm -hmm. to portray your character. Yeah. And do you plan on having it that, e that each venture is going to have um, three, sp um, one specialization to eat for, um, for each archetype or is it going to be a case where they're, where they're going to favor two and ignore one? Uh, yeah, so there are three specialization types right now, which is uh, Valiant, uh, Vanguard, and Vigilant. And the van uh, Vanguard is sort of the tanky slash healer uh, role, which is either they're, more, they're basically more defensive or protective in nature. The Valiant, which is more of a melee slash DPS role, uh, where it's all about either movement or uh, fighting in melee, whereas and the vigilant is more of the range slash uh, map control focused role, mm -hmm. uh, and these three. Uh, let me see. It's like, and each so far in the in the rule book, each venture has two specializations. Uh, some of them. Uh, some of them is like one in that role and another in the other role, uh, one of one of the three. But some, like the Arms Master, which is sort of like a very melee-focused uh, venture, has both of their specializations within the same role. So both of them are Valiant, which is melee. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of meant to be uh, just like descriptive of to help the player understand what, uh, what sort of specialization, uh, this is meant to evoke like the kind of player fantasy, because the arms master it has, uh, one specialization is more geared towards like a samurai type play style, which is things like chasing your blade and attacking, uh, deflecting projectiles, whereas another. Uh, specialization is more geared towards like a uh, devil may cry type playstyle where you juggle enemies in the air and so these uh, specializations are more so meant to inform that kind of uh, playstyle you want to focus on to and uh, it's not um, it's not you know obligate obligated that they are meant to fit into one or one role or specifically they can you know focus into more roles uh more so than others they're more the roles are more so like descriptive of how you're supposed to perceive 
uh, receive them. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to talk a bit on voyaging. That's something I didn't get a whole lot of opportunity to talk about last time. And it sounds to me that voyaging is is going to be a bit is a one of the three big pillars of I, I won't say three big pillars, but one of the major pillars in in um the ex, in, as far as representing the exploration aspect of Voyager tactics, the well, for lack of a better word, voyage. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what I'm cu what I'm curious about is how is um how it came to be. Was there some aspect of the clock design when it comes when it came to the passage of day? How do you how did the um, concept of voyaging manifest? So, uh, so obviously, making a game like Voyager, it would, uh, I couldn't exactly make like a game about uh, exploring, uh, exploring a post-apocalypse Earth without having, kind of like, ex you know, having like fairly detailed exploration mechanics. Uh, I didn't want it to be just purely uh, combat focus, but uh, it took a lot of researching into different uh, different systems and all that. But I think what kind of resonated with me most is kind of like a West Marches style uh, approach, Excellent. which yeah. A little bit of hex scroll, a little bit of West Marchers. That the idea behind West Marchers is the idea of a persistent world, which means that uh, because you know it's about like many game masters uh, arranging many different game groups within the same campaign setting, and if and time is always sort of uh, persistent in those settings because. If group A is doing something at this location, group B needed to know the rough time frame so that uh, there's like a sort of internal consistency within uh, the timeline of that setting. And that's always fascinated me when researching how West Marches style games are run. And which is why Voyager itself is built uh, to be. Uh, West much as compatible to allow this sort of uh, play with uh, game groups. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the time system where during your mission, uh, I needed a sense, uh, something to gauge not only the passage of time, but also the urgency of certain missions. So some missions would have like a deadline or some sort of timer to indicate that uh, if they didn't act soon enough, they would uh, lose the lead or they would you know, lose the artifact or whatever it is they were seeking. And, and this also sort of ties back into like the whole uh, rest and sleep system because uh, you could rest more often in order to heal more, to be more prepared for battles. But if you did so, you would cause more time to pass and therefore would potentially risk uh, losing uh, the mission entirely. So that kind of, I would sort of play around with uh, that kind of time system. And it's still fairly abstracted because uh, it's not like specific time calculation. It's just uh, five time slots that uh, which is morning, noon, evening, night, and midnight. Uh, so three slots, uh, three slots in the day and two at night. That, uh, and whenever the party performs like a major scene or combat encounter, then it advances by one time slot, and uh, it's just a very quick and easy way to sort of calculate the passage of time, mm -hmm. and which is very much informed from like. Uh, Persona, the Persona series, which I liked uh, how that kind of, I did want to emulate that kind of time passage and calendar system in some form to sort of convey deadlines and all this. And also, uh, 
it's not that apparent in the options so far in the rulebook, but I also did over time. Uh, I want to add like more mechanics, let's say uh, character abilities or different things that interact with the day night cycle. For example, uh, for example, some enemies being more powerful at night or at day having certain buffs. So that is also another part of the whole day night cycle thing. Yeah. Now, when it comes to NPCs and and adversaries, do you plan on do you plan on um, putting in a system to create to allow players and GMs to create custom NPCs? Uh, you mean NPCs as in enemies or just like regular characters? Both. Uh, right. So for enemies, uh, this is definitely something. Uh, I wanted to tackle because uh, in terms of like GMing, what I think for me, what uh, looked most intimidating as a GM is sort of looking at the different enemy stat blocks and having to see like all like, like each enemy having like a list of associated uh, attributes, modifiers and skills and all these different things. Uh, which, uh, even though, yes, you may not use them all in your game, just the prospect of looking at them uh, was quite intimidating. And I wanted uh, an enemy design system that was streamlined so that uh, the GM could run them easily because I knew for the the player fantasy I wanted that I wanted... Uh, the players to be able to mow through multiple waves of enemies at once, which means that, uh, of course, uh, there are like minions, minion rules in this game where uh, single hit enemies that you would sort of be very easily be able to, uh, for the players to uh, dispatch of, as well as for the GM to sort of run because they have very simplified rules for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, a very so for the enemy design is a very template based a design approach where um which I've outlined in the rule book itself where you have certain templates that you would arrange enemies into so instead of instead of having like three separate enemy stat blocks like a melee fighter uh a ranged archer and a magic user which each have like occupy like three different stat blocks on a page it's more like uh, these templates can be applied to all enemies which is you have a frontline type a backline type mm -hmm. and support types uh tank types and all you had to do was just uh it just outlines certain uh, things you would do so frontline is sort of the baseline template you would use they would have like all the same stats um, and a backline, uh, it notes that you would give them either equal or less health or resolve than a regular frontline enemy. Uh, and also it denotes like certain behaviors you should observe when running these enemies, like a frontliner would attempt to engage in melee, whereas a backliner will usually retreat when advanced upon. Hmm. And these are... And these templates are meant to be uh, written so that uh, they inform the GM about how to run, the, like all the information is pertinent to like exactly what they would see, uh, what is observable, you know, on the table and something that can be applied to all enemies and how you become, get more specific with them is uh, through like certain enemy archetypes so if an enemy so archetypes are like you know if it's an ele elemental type enemy then uh you would apply like element element build elemental build up on, onto their attacks basically they inflict 
uh, kind of elemental status conditions, mm-hmm. boost their attacks. Uh, if it was like a dragon archetype, then but then perhaps you could give them like a flying trait. So uh, it's definitely a very modular approach to enemy design where you kind of have these templates and you would apply uh, different rules and abilities on them based on uh, based on what kind of enemy you want to run. Mm. And that also includes like the tier system. And the tier system is basically like uh, my what the solution I tried to give for things like the power level or challenge rating for um, for an enemy, and it's just divided into three, uh, four tiers, which is like the minion tier, which basically means uh, they don't have any special traits to them, and as you increase in tier, from like a regular enemy to like more of an more of a boss type to uh, and then more of like an elite uh, boss where uh, each enemy uh, tier has access to more abilities. So uh, so instead of different stat blocks, it's more like a suite of abilities that this enemy type has access to. So the boss version of this enemy um, would have all the abilities that its lower tiers would have access to and its own special abilities and it's all it's of like a scale that you follow to sort of denote how uh, powerful the enemy is Mm -hmm. now with that and with that in mind uh, what would you say has been one of the big takeaways in the last few months when it comes to develop when it comes to developing like what were there any sort of things that you thought you thought were um, surefire winners, but but with play testing, some holes ended up developing. I think so far the past few months of refining the system. Uh, I think one of the things that I've been more satisfied with is the fact that the more I work on it the more streamlined in a lot of areas it's becoming and the more uh because this version 0.5 is the version that i can sort of say uh confidently compared to last time where it's actually uh resembling what i would call a final version because it reached a point where I'm fairly confident in uh, the die systems and uh, all these core resolution mechanics because uh, a lot of the previous versions were just me experimenting, trying to find the best uh, uh, dice rolling system and how to resolve actions. And a lot of it has been overhauled uh, just to sort of figure it out. But with 0.5, that's sort of been the main breakthrough which is sort of like focusing on the kind of action duration uh, system and uh, sort of kind of basing, you know, everything. Because uh, if I had to change the action system in all the previous versions, which was basically every, every version, was... I had to basically rewrite all the abilities from scratch and rearrange the classes and all that. So, uh, and all the damage numbers and all these sort of things. And it's from figuring out the main dice system and the action resolution that uh, I finally feel that it's getting towards. Uh, get it, it. It will hopefully not uh, not deviate too far, and it's mostly just like. I can focus more on less on trying to come up with new solutions and now it's just more on just pure polishing uh, the current system and the layout of the book as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I will be looking forward to seeing it. I know that you are are gearing up for doing doing a full Kickstarter release 
in the future. Yeah, definitely. We're kind of planning that in its very, very early stages. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like I said, I'll be looking forward to seeing how that develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, thank you for inviting me back. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>